Hey, I hate to tell you this, but we have a real crisis in psychology. One that's been going on for quite a while now, but it's only intensified in the last few years as we really start to grapple with the fact that many of our classic studies and in many of our recent studies in psychology are just not replicating. That is, we can't reproduce the results that we had in those earlier studies, and it makes us all wonder, what's going on in psychology? Are we gonna be able to survive this? So what I wanna do here is give you an excerpt of a lecture that I've been giving about the origins of this crisis and basically what the crisis actually is. And then I'll come back at the end of the lecture and tell you a little bit more about it. When I first talked about this a couple years ago to my students, most of them hadn't heard a thing about it. So let me go ahead and just talk a little bit about it from a historical perspective. So I'm gonna go ahead and talk about some of the antecedents that led to this current crisis in psychology. And I have here, uh, thanks to Andrew Gelman, who isn't actually in psychology, but has been blogging about the crisis for a while now, and he's got a lot of historical information up there. So one of the first people that I want to talk about that is antecedent is this psychologist, Paul Meal, who really made some really interesting, profound contributions to the philosophy of his psychology. He was interested in some of those arguments that came from the Vienna Circle and the logical positivists and how science should proceed. And so he was always uh, in his career as a psychologist thinking about psychology as a science and what are our weaknesses and strengths and why do we do the things that we do. Anyway, he talked about this back in the 60s and 70s. He said, a zealous and clever investigator can slowly wend his way through a tenuous nomological network performing a long series of related experiments which appear to the uncritical readers as a fine example of an integrated research program without ever once re refuting or corroborating so much as a single strand of the network. And so what he's trying to say here is that in a way, what any good researcher could do, an effective researcher, is just present a body of research from their lab, from their line of research, that just shows a clear path of experiments or other studies here that support their theory, their point of view. And he called this the fine statistical significance any way you can and declare victory paradigm. You could be motivated to make sure that your findings are statistically significant. And once you do, then you can move on and declare victory that you were right. And so this means that statistical significance becomes the primary thing that we're focused on, that we want to show we have a significant effect. Why it is that in psychology we focus so much on P less than 0.05. Without getting into the history of that, we can at least acknowledge the fact that this is the way that psychology has become, that we now really do focus on our statistical significance. And without it, you can't really declare victory. Jacob Cohen, statistician in psychology, talked about this a lot too. Cohen studied statistical power, spreading the idea that design and data collection were central to good research in psychology. And he published this important book about statistical power analysis for the behavioral sciences. So he's the person who first really uh, showed us that we had to be considering our power of our research in order to make good conclusions about our data. Now, here's some other important developments that I think you need to think about. In 2001, we have a young professor. She had actually just finished her PhD from Harvard, where she had published her uh, research from her PhD in some major journals, then had been hired at the University of Texas as a new assistant professor. And in between the time that she had finished her PhD and she was now about to show up at the University of Texas, she was discovered to have faked some of her data. And so three papers that were published in a very prestigious journal, the Journal of Personality and Social Psychology, had to be retracted because she had completely faked her findings. She had just messed with the data to make it look like she had significant effects and therefore got her papers published. So this is like one of the first times that we had somebody who was like a rising star in psychology who was brought down because of the fact that she had actually faked some of her data. Then in 2009, another interesting paper came out that kind of pointed out some of the problems of the way that psychology was going. And this one focused on the rise of neuroscience and in particular social neuroscience and its emphasis on doing fMRI research. So Vul, Harris, and Winkleman and Paschler published a paper that had been dubbed the Voodoo Correlations Paper. And what they did is they reported on how there were a lot of statistical problems in neuroscience in the way that people were analyzing their fMRI data. And basically, it goes back to the idea that Paul Meal had, which is that above all, you want statistical significance. So MRI researchers with their very small, low-powered studies had found a series of ways to 
analyze their data to yield findings that they could say were statistically significant. And what Vol et al. argued in this paper is that this had led to a lot of really bad studies being published in which it looked like through statistical jiggery that they had able to come up with some uh, findings. Then in 2011, a lot of important things happened in 2011. Simmons et al. published a paper called False Positive Psychology, Undisclosed Flexibility in Data Collection and Analysis Allows Presenting Anything as Significant. And this was a paper in the journal Psychological Science, and they introduced this term, Searcher Degrees of Freedom. And we'll talk about researcher degrees of freedom in a little bit, but this is a really first time that we get a paper that's really starting to bring up some of the current problems that we have. Another thing that happened though in 2011 was that Daryl Bem, a famous social psychologist, published a nine study ESP paper in JPSP. And Daryl Bem was now a prominent psychologist uh, in uh, his university, I think it was at Cornell. And he for a while had been really interested in ESP and had come up with experiments. And overall, he argued that he had found evidence for ESP. And when he published this paper, there was a lot of immediate skepticism saying, come on, ESP isn't real. There's something wrong with these studies. And the editor responded by saying, four reviewers made comments on the manuscripts, and these are very trusted people. And the paper got published. And then the other thing that happened in 2011 was that we had more episodes of misconduct reported, like the ones that happened with Karen Ruggiero, where Dietrich Stoppel at Tilburg University was found to have, again, faked a lot of data. That Mark Hauser at Harvard University had faked a lot of data, and both of those people lost their jobs. So this was quite a key year, just 2011, where we have a lot of uproar going on in psychology and making people question where we're going in the field. So what happened in 2011 to 2015 is that our field of psychology started paying more attention to this. And you can see important blogs that are then started, new ways for people to communicate and discuss these things like Neuroskeptic, Andrew Gelman's at Columbia, Retraction Watch. And then you also get the Center for Open Science and the Open Science Framework software projects are started. This all happened during that time period. And people start reporting papers in which they fail to replicate noteworthy studies. And so now more papers coming out during this time period showing us that once famous studies that seem to be above reproach, people now attempting to replicate them can't replicate them. So that leads us then to this question. What exactly then is the crisis? What would you say is really the problem that's been uncovered in these last few years. One answer, and this goes back to that Simmons et al. paper that was published in 2011, is that we have a proliferation of what they call in that paper of false positives. That false positives, where you reject the null hypothesis when we shouldn't, are a costly error. Because once they appear in the literature, they are particularly persistent. So if you say you had a significant effect, but it turns out you really didn't have one, it's a null result, then when somebody else tries to replicate it and only gets a null result, it's hard to get that null result paper published because it failed to replicate. False positives are also a waste of our resources. We have maybe fruitless research programs out there, uh, students trying to do a thesis where they're following up on some study, and if it was really just a false positive in the first place, they're not going to find anything. And maybe also we'll get ineffective policy changes. And if there's a lot of these false positives, then the field is going to start to lose credibility. In psychology, even though we have a nominal false positive rate of less than 5%, so that's what we say when we say P is less than 0.05, they say we have these research degrees of freedom that increase the rate, that we try to manipulate our analyses and do things to it so that we actually get significant results. And this again goes back to Paul Meal. We want to have this record of success, this steady pattern across all of our studies that show that our theory or our uh, big hypothesis or whatever it is that we're trying to get out there is significant, we do what we can using these research degrees of freedom, research degrees of freedom to increase that rate above 0.05. So you could say, well, does that really happen? And one of the ways that we can see it really happens is by doing what's called a P-curve analysis. And Daniel Lackins first started talking about this in 2014. He looked at the p-values of studies that have examined things like the elderly prime effect, where this is a phenomenon in social cognition where you can activate a stereotype of the elderly and then make your participants move more slowly. So you make people think about old people and then you ask them to walk away. And when they walk away, they walk more slowly than if they didn't have that stereotype. And then there's also something called the professor prime effect, 
where you can activate the stereotype of professors, and this will make people work harder and perform better on tasks. And an example of this is Diesterhaus and Van Nippenberg in 1998. And so what Lackens did is he took uh, 18 p-values from 17 studies that had been done on the elderly priming effect in eight different articles, and he plotted them and said, how many of them are at p less than 0.01? How many of them are 0 0.02, 0 0.03, 0 0.04, 0 0.05? And so that's the dark line there. And you can see that most of the uh, p-values, the what the 44% of them, are actually at the 0.05 level. Very few of them are at 0 0.03, 0 0.02, 0 0.01. So those numbers above the black line are the percentage of p-values that had those p particular p-values. The problem with that is that if you uh, just take a, a modeling of what p-values should be like naturally occurring in the world, and you have 33% power to detect a real phenomenon, you should in fact get more p-values just by chance that are at the small end of the continuum, that are at 0 0.01 or 0 0.02. Very few should be at the 0 0.05 level if you have a real effect. But you can see across these studies that in fact, researchers are giving us a lot of p-values that are just below 0.05. And that is a bit suspicious. That tells us that perhaps the people are hacking away at their p-values to get them just below 0.05 so they can get their papers accepted. So perhaps these are a lot of false positives on the elderly priming effect. Just by contrast, looking at this other literature, on uh, the professor priming effect, you can see that when you look at their p-values across eight articles, these are 16 studies, that about half of the p-values were around 0.01, only about 5% or just around the 0.05 level. And this follows a better model of what you would normally expect for p-values. So this particular group of studies doesn't look like it's been p-hacked. It doesn't look like people were using researcher degrees of freedom to do this. He says here in Lackens that most likely the, they overestimated the effect size of R0.36 at the minimal sample of size to achieve a statistical power of 0.8 would require 28 participants in each between subjects condition. The average sample size in each between subject condition in the reviewed studies was 24, and six of the performed experiments had sufficient power to detect an effect of R equals 0.36. What he's saying here is that in this group of studies, the ones in the elderly priming effect, that the problem was they really were not testing very many participants. They had low statistical power. Even though Jacob Cohen decades ago wrote about how much statistical power we have to have in our studies and how you get to it, researchers are actually conducting the research with too few participants to help them detect real findings there with that kind of power. And so this, again, maybe is the explanation about why people are involved in doing things where they mess around with their statistics enough so they get just below 0.05 because they didn't really have the power in the first place to get the findings. So they have to use these questionable practices to get to that. So I call them, instead of uh, researchers' degrees of freedom, I focus on this thing called QRPs or questionable research practices. And so some of the ones that have been pointed out in recent years are that maybe in psychology we're using too many small sample sizes, which is typically overestimate their study's power and underestimate the sample size they need to obtain just a 0.8 power with a small effect size. You can see this in this article by Backer et al. that was published in 2016 where they asked psychology researchers about how much power they think they need. So you say to the researchers, typically you say to them, how do you actually figure out the sample sizes of your studies? And the answers that they got in a survey of psychology research was practical constraints. So a lot of people say they just test as many as feasible, given their practical constraints that they have in their research. Some of them just choose a rule of thumb, like maybe it was taught to them. They should always have 20 people per condition. A lot of people say this is just the way it is. It's a common practice in developmental psychology that we test 10 babies in each condition. So they're just saying this is what our common practice is. And others just say, I just want to collect as much data as possible. I just We just test as many people as we can until we just wear out, we run out of resources or whatever. You'll notice that none of these answers are really focused on statistical explanations. No one's actually saying that they pick their sample size based on uh, Cohen's work on power. And so if you look at just a two-condition experiment, if you had a control and an experimental condition, and you talked about power of 0.8, which is what the recommended power should be in a study, uh, although some people are now going up to 0.9 or 0.95, that really if you have a, an effect there and you have a, a small effect, a medium effect, or a very large effect size, that if you have a small effect and you're looking for a power of 0.8, you're going to need 788 participants to notice a small effect just in a two-condition experiment. 
When you ask researchers what they think they need, they say you only need 216 people when you have a small effect. So they really greatly underestimate the number of participants they really need if they have a small effect size. If they have a medium effect size, you can see they do better here. That is, if you have a pretty good sizable effect from your independent variable or whatever it is that you're comparing, you're going to need about 128 participants, 64 in each condition. That's pretty close to what the psychology researchers in this study estimated it to be. And if you have a very large effect size, researchers tend to overestimate the number that you need because there you can get by actually with 26 people per condition. I think the real problem is that probably a lot of our research is on that small to medium size. And that a lot of us are way op too optimistic about our effects being in the medium to high or to large size. The bottom line then though, should be that you should aim for at least 60 participants per condition if you want to assume a medium effect size and have power to be at 0.8. If you're going to increase your power to what now people are recommending, you're going to even need more participants. If you have a smaller effect size that you want to assume, you're going to even need many more participants. Another questionable research practice is that we have selective reporting or partial publication of our data. The issue here is that a lot of people conduct many analyses and then only pick out the analyses that support their hypotheses or have significant effects and then don't refer or mention the other measures, the other analyses where they didn't have effects. This again goes back to Paul Meal and saying we like to have this perfect looking record of accomplishments and victories uh, as we conducted our research. And so you can just cherry pick through your results to support the things that fit your hypotheses, which you wrote about in the introduction, and not report everything that you actually did. Another problem is what's called optional stopping. And this is the idea that researchers collect their data until they get a significant result. So they just keep checking. They go ahead and test a certain number of participants, then check to see if they got a significant effect. They say, no, I can't do that. So they go ahead and collect some more data. The main reason why people do that probably is because they're trying to keep to uh, conserve their resources. So maybe it costs a lot of money to test participants. And so in order to keep the cost down, they try to run as few people as possible, run the analyses, then see if they have a significant effect. And if they don't, go ahead and collect some more data. The problem with this is this also inflates your type one error. And I can't get into it right now, but Simmons et al. talks about it in their article that basically every time you do this, you end up, if you took that dotted red line there, that's the P.05 level, you actually are inflating the chances you're going to get a false positive by running more people every time you find a non-significant effect and then testing them again and seeing if you get an effect. You're just by chance more likely to get a false positive then. We have this problem of p-value rounding where people do things like take their p less than 0.05, right? But let's say they've got a p-value of 0.051 or 0.6 or 0.65. And what they do is they round it down so it's below 0.05. And there is a way of dealing with this now. It's called stat check where you can take this uh, particular software, feed through a manuscript to it or someone's article and check the values to see if indeed those p-values are really what they say they are because of rounding errors. So this is a way to check your own work to make sure you haven't done it, but also to check other people to see if they maybe have been rounding their p-values just to make sure they look like they have a statistical effect when they don't. Another questionable research practice we have is the file drawer effect. And this has to do with the fact that our field of psychology is really so focused on positive results that we end up not reporting our null results. And so it could be that we uh, hide a lot of our studies that didn't work out. They don't get published. We also have this problem of what's called post hoc storytelling. It's also known as hypothesizing after the results are known. What's happening here is that a lot of uh, researchers take their findings after their analyses and discover that you know, things are more complicated than what they originally hypothesized, or maybe even their findings are wrong. They don't support their hypotheses, or that the logic that led to this experiment was wrong. And so they don't want to look like they were uh, wrong the whole time. They don't want to look like they have a opposite result of what they predict. So what they do is they go back and change their story. They change the introduction so that it fits with what the results actually are. And so then we have a better story. It's That's what the story is, right? So this is a questionable practice that's been around. We've known about this for quite a long time. Norbert Carr actually talked about this back in 1998 that he called it harking back then. In fact, a lot of psychologists have been told by their supervisors or have been trained that they should have a good story and that they should engage in harking despite the problems that this would have. Because again, it inflates what looks like possibly type one errors, false positives, making it look like we have findings when we really don't have them because maybe it was just by chance. So even though you didn't have good 
theoretical reasons to have this null result, you've changed it to make it look like it did. And so therefore you're uh, propagating uh, perhaps a, a null effect or, I'm sorry, a false positive. Another questionable research practice that people have found is the manipulation of outliers. And what this means is that people do things with the outliers in their data, include them, not include them, change the cutoffs until they get the significant result that they want. And just an example of this, uh, Simmons et al. looked at in their 2011 paper how 30 psychological science articles had reported reaction times. And keep in mind, all of these are just fairly simple cognitive experiments where people have to press a button really fast to some stimulus. And they looked at how people decided whether or not their reaction times were too fast. And what they found in these 30 articles was that some people used the cutoff of the fastest 2.5%, some used two standard deviations from the mean, some said that anything that was faster than 100 or 150 or 200 or 300 milliseconds was too fast. When you look at the two slow responses, people uh, in these articles mentioned things like they only they got rid of the slowest 2.5% or the slowest 10%, or they use two or two and a half or three standard deviations slower than the mean or one and a half slower standard deviations slower than that conditions mean or they use cutoffs of like 1,000, 1,200, 1,500, 2,000, 3,000 or 5,000 milliseconds. Why I show all that up is just to show you that something as fairly straightforward as what a reaction time is that we get this wide variety of practices about determining what's an outlier, what should be excluded as too fast or too slow. And what Simmons and all want to suggest here is that reason maybe why there's all this variability here is that the researchers are changing the cutoffs while they're analyzing their data to give them the best results. So maybe they found that if they use 5,000 milliseconds is too slow, then they got results that supported their hypotheses. But if they only use 1,200 as their cutoff, it didn't. And so this is a problem if people are picking and doing things with their outliers and and uh, not um, staking what they're going to say, that it, what the outliers are going to be before they actually conduct the research. They're going to wait to see what the effects are on their analyses. Then again, they could possibly be going for that just below 0.05 effect, and we're going to get more false positives. So here are all of these research practices all done at once. We use small sample sizes, selective reporting or partial publication of our data, optional stopping, p-value rounding, file drawer effect, post hoc storytelling and the manipulation of outliers. And the bigger problem then is that the cumulative effect of all of these QRPs is that perhaps then our published findings in psychology are much stronger than they actually are, which then led to this bombshell of a paper that came out in August of 2015 that was published in Science. And you can see it's uh, published by many authors called the Open Science Collaboration. And this is considered another sign that we are indeed or have been in a crisis here in psychology. What happened here was that they took 100 studies that had been published in some of our top journals in psychology in recent years and had different teams around the globe try to replicate that study as best as they could. They tried to contact the original author. They tried to use exactly the same stimulus materials. And then they conducted the study and they looked to see whether or not it had been replicated. And what they found was that only 39% of the original 100 studies could be replicated and in terms of giving them significant results. And you can see that here, that the the blue, the greenish, bluish aqua bar circles here are the ones that were replicated. All the other ones were not replicated. They weren't significant. And it has something to do with perhaps the original effect size, that if the original study had a bigger effect size, you saw more studies being replicated there. Although there are plenty of studies that had uh, large original effect sizes that weren't replicated in their replication project. But still, the overall bottom line is that only 39% of these replicated studies had significant results. They looked at a lot of different characteristics of these studies to try to understand whether or not a study could be replicated. And there are different things here. One of the things that you could predict is that the surprisingness of the original result, that is, if you went back and looked at the article where that study was originally presented, and you asked uh, judges who know about the field to say, how surprising do you think that result was at that particular time? You could see that actually was negatively correlated with whether or not the study now replicated. So the sort of the more surprising the original study was, the less likely it was to replicate in this replication project, which maybe tells us again that the original study had a false positive.
maybe it wasn't really something that you would have thought from theory should have happened. And because it was something that was so unexpected, that's in fact why it got published. Maybe the journal liked it because it was such a novel finding. But those turn out to be more likely to be the studies that don't replicate when you try one of these replication projects. There's been criticisms of the project itself that was published in Science. Uh, you can see Gilbert and his colleagues talked about the fact that they thought there were a lot of problems in the way this project was done. And they go ahead and argue that there's lots of statistical errors. But then there was a comment back to, to, uh, to Gilbert and his colleagues. And they say, no, we did take into account all these statistical problems that you're saying that we have. And they very nicely go through and de de deal with them. So there's been pushback, was what I'm trying to say, is that when that article came out that showed only 39% of the studies replicated, there's been a lot of uh, symposia, conferences, papers, uh, attacking the original replicability project and trying to find problems with it. And then the people behind that project have pushed back and said, no, here's some things we can show you. All of our analyses, all of our methods are actually freely available. They're all open. You can look at them yourself. I just want to point out that this crisis sometimes has been viewed as just a crisis that was limited to social psychology because a lot of these experiments that didn't replicate were social psychology experiments. And some of the people who read these replication studies were actually social psychologists. It's not just limited to social psychology. Uh, for instance, there's another paper that was published here in 2013 in Nature Reviews Neuroscience, in which the authors of this paper were arguing that uh, neuroscience has this problem as well. And you remember, this goes back to that voodoo correlations uh, study that uh, argued that maybe there's a lot of statistical jiggery going on in the way that people are analyzing neuroscience data because it's really low powered. But Button et al. argued in this paper was that uh, neuroscience studies, for many reasons, end up being really underpowered. So if you look there at the right where it says 81 to 90, that should be the kind of power that you would expect in a study. Uh, remember I said the normal standard is 0.8 or 80% for power. And very few studies in this analysis that they were going at here uh, actually showed that studies were powered at 0.8 or higher. In fact, many studies have, most studies have much lower power than that in neuroscience. The reason why that happens in neuroscience, of course, is that because the methods are so expensive. It's expensive to do an fMRI scan. It's expensive or difficult to use animals to do dissections or do other kinds of things. So they do tend to have small samples, but statistically that means then they have low power and therefore they're probably like less likely to get a significant effect if they want to get them published. So perhaps again, they're in getting themselves engaged in a lot of statistical jiggery or questionable research practices. One of the things that the authors of the Buttonall article paper argue is that perhaps what researchers need to do in neuroscience is work more collaboratively to increase their power and to replicate their findings. And even hormone research is suspect. This is a paper that was published in 2016 by a friend of mine. And you can see here that they looked at oxytocin studies and found that uh, intranasal oxytocin studies are generally underpowered. And that one of the reasons why we have this wide variety of effects of oxytocin on behavior, you might've heard of it, this is like the love drug or something, is that perhaps again, the problem is that our studies in oxytocin are generally underpowered. We have few, too few participants and there might be a lot of false positives going on. All right, so now that I got you all worried about our crisis in psychology, you might be wondering, what's the solution? What are we gonna do about it? Well, many smart people have been working on this problem for the last few years and come up with a lot of really great solutions. So in the next video that I have here, I'm gonna go ahead and show you exactly what it is that we've been doing and what some of the solutions are. And it's a very positive story, I think, with a happy ending.